podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm the ghost of Dave Hendrick, joined by Mr. Carl Matchett. How are you, sir? Good morning for your former self. Yeah, me too. Me too, my friend. However, it did mean, as Guy pointed out, that I didn't have to talk about that mess of a game at the weekend. You were at the game. Um, would you like to take any responsibility for what, what took place? Uh, dear, absolutely not. I'm not I'm not taking the... I'm not taking pelters for this one. Absolutely nothing to do with me. Even I sat in the press box, did more running than some of them in that first half. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just an absolutely pathetic performance uh, from start to finish. But, you know, it's funny, Carl. We've talked all season about how Arsenal, they, they've had to play as well as they possibly can to scrape wins and scrape wins. And this was yet another example. And I know the score ended 3-1. But despite the fact that we were awful, we went in 1-1. And I don't think they score a second goal if Van Dijk and Alisson don't mess up. I don't think they score a second goal. I think the likelihood is that game ends in a draw or we sneak the win. I think there's an awful lot of chatter about that Arsenal performance with people missing the big picture, which is no matter how dominant they are, they simply do not create good enough chances or have good enough finishers to take advantage of their ability to control football matches. Yeah, that's fair. I think um, the second half, when it started with the way that we started, uh, Obviously, we were wildly fortunate to go in at halftime level, but we were able to then raise our game. We were able to then play in a different way. And we certainly, in the first, let's say, 10 minutes or whatever, created enough chances to be probably as far ahead at that point as Arsenal should have been at half time. Um, and this was through our good performance rather than in the first half, I felt more of Arsenal's chances came through our bad performance rather than their own good stuff, if you get what I mean. There wasn't like loads of incisive build-up play which sighed through us. It was a series of terrible passes out of defence, poor transition work, uh, obviously defensive mix-ups um, after after half-time. So I thought, uh, despite we only had 10 minutes of actually playing football, really, I thought that 10 minutes was maybe slightly better than anything our Arsenal offered while playing well, let's say. But that's not to suggest anything about us taking any points uh, from that game. We were so bizarre. Mm. Um, Very, very odd performance from at least three members of the back four uh, in possession and positional play. Uh, Yeah, I I think we were lucky to be 1-1 at halftime in the extreme. So I don't really consider it points dropped from that point, to be honest, Uh, even if we did briefly look as though we could go and take the game on. I thought the the right hand side that sunk us like that was oh, that was an abomination. Business. That it, it was abysmal. Trent didn't look like he wanted to be there. Gakpo, I mean, he's he, why is he playing on the right wing? Diaz has played on the right wing. We know he's good there. We know Gakpo is predominantly in his career a left winger. If you have to play one of them, one of them on the right, surely it should be Diaz. Well, I mean, Jota was nominally from the right uh, in the last couple of games, and yeah, doing it very, very well, you know. So I didn't really understand that switch to make it an entirely new right deck. Um, 
as in number eight, obviously with Graven Birch coming in, Trent and then Gakpo. So we could have at least kept one of them the same. And then Gakpo, even if not effective, would be in his nominally normal role for us. So mm. it was a bit odd, but like I say, I don't think even that would have made a whole lot of difference, maybe to our attack and play, maybe to a bit better press and work, which was totally absent first half. But, um, you know, the forwards can do what they want if the defenders are giving the ball away on the edge of their own box, are probably going to give up scoring chances. Yeah, it's true. It is true. Um, that right side was just, it was it was absolutely shambolic. And yeah. Jürgen needs to have a, a long, hard look at himself for that team selection. Um but like the bottom line is we're still top. So I know that City are two points behind with the game in hand and yada, yada, yada. They still have to come to Anfield. So they have to come to Anfield and, and avoid defeat. If we beat City, the ball is back in our court. So that's just the mission. Just go and win every game from here on. It's a favourable run of fixtures. Bar Villa away, all our tough games are at home. I I think it, you know, it's as good an opportunity as we're going to have. So it's one game. The other thing is, as well, we were going to lose at some point. Like this team, regardless of how impressed we are with how quickly things have, have turned around from last year, this team was never going to be good enough to go an entire Premier League season without a legitimate defeat. Mm. So we were going to lose at some point. Now, we may well lose again, but I'd rather get the defeat out of the way, away to Arsenal, where at least you can say, yeah, well, they're a top four team. You know, they're a good team. Then let's say lose at Brentford in, in a couple of weeks. Do you know? I'd rather lose to to Arsenal and get it out of the way and at least you can kind of put it behind you and use it to galvanise you. And it might just be a bit of a wake-up call to some of the players as well. Like, this isn't going to be easy. You're going to have to go and win and work for every win. So at least that's done now. And as well as that, there won't be any crying twats come the end of the season if we do win the league about how we were robbed of an invincible season and all that. So that's all nice. Um, This weekend, we will take on Burnley. And Burnley are a rather different outfit to Arsenal. Uh, They currently sit second from bottom of the Premier League, with the only real chance they have of survival being the potential for Everton and Nottingham Forest to be docked points for FFP breaches. Uh, For Everton, obviously, it would be their second such points deduction. I'm not even sure that they'd be able to stay up, even if Everton got docked to nine and Forest got docked to 11, which would lift Burnley out of the relegation zone. I don't think they'd manage to stay out of it, Carl. They have been abysmal this season absolutely abysmal they've won three games they beat newly promoted Luton they beat newly promoted Sheffield United and they did beat Fulham to be fair they've also taken uh, a point from Nottingham Forest who are obviously in the relegation mix Luton again in the relegation mix a point from Fulham in their last game which was a good comeback to be fair and their best result of the season was a 1-1 draw away at Brighton, who were in a dreadful run of form at the time. This has gone very, very badly for Vincent Company and Co. It has. Um, I mean, I think it's maybe one position below par um, with you, when you consider Luton are above them and they probably would have expected to be better than them in the Premier League. Um if they'd have finished 18th this season, I don't think there would have been very many raised eyebrows or any kind of surprise or anything. Um, I thought first six weeks of the season, I watched them quite closely and it was very, very clear what they were. Uh, Really nice team in between both boxes, good patterns, fairly aggressive at times, neat on the ball, good movement, not super rapid, but, you know, fairly quick enough to play uh, in terms of the tempo of their game but in both penalty boxes, rubbish. 
proper rubbish. Mm. Um, you know, you get some odd moments up front where you have one or two of the players who have nice combinations. Um, sort of midway through the season, we spoke a couple of times about um, the the performances which improved from Wilson Odebert firstly, and then Luca Koliosho. Obviously, they've had injuries there as well to contend with uh, for those players, but basically speaking just not enough quality not enough mm. consistency not enough service just in general attacking in the penalty box not a premier league team and at the other end of the pitch i would say exactly the same like the partnerships in defense are reasonably consistent and at this point if they were going to be good enough for the premier league i would expect them to be consistently close to clean sheets really strong defensively really solid as an organizational unit, that kind of thing. They're not, they're not at any point close to clean sheets, really. Uh, a one nil defeat in the cup was as close as they've really come to that conceded at home to Bur- uh, to Luton. Other games have been pretty much two and three goals conceded each time. Uh, again, you'll see like good performances at times. Um, uh, James Trafford, obviously a young goalkeeper debut mm. season for the Premier League. And I think he's done himself good, but by and large, that's because of shot stopping, which again, I say this all the time when we talk about goalkeepers. If you're good at shot stopping, good. If you're not good at shot stopping, you're not really a goalkeeper. So yeah. you can do all the other stuff as well, but you have to be good at making saves. That's like a basic requirement. So I'm not sure how good he is, but he's certainly been busy and has proven himself able to do that side of things. Some games he's kept them in it, but he's had to because the rest of the defense just hasn't been up to scratch from not just individual perspective, but as I say, the organizations, the partnerships, uh, and the level of consistency that they're able to reach. Yeah, yeah. James Trafford, like you said, he, he's proven that he's a goalkeeper. He He's yet to prove what level of goalkeeper he is, but he has proven that he is a goalkeeper. Um, two clean sheets on the season uh, in the league, so not great, not great at all. Did keep two more in the uh, League Cup, including one against mighty Salford City, if you don't mind. Look, I said in the summer when they did their business that I liked a lot of what they did. The issue I took was you didn't you didn't you didn't get someone that you knew was going to get you twelve to fifteen Premier League goals. You bought some outstanding young forward players. I think Zeki Amdoni looks a real player. I think as a second striker. I think he could be very, very good. Odebert, he's a star in the making. Uh, Koliashu, another one that, that looks like a potential star. I'm a big fan of Aaron Ramsey, who they brought in, obviously, from, from Villa. Um, they brought in Mike Tresser, paid significant enough money to get him on, on a loan with an option to buy, and he hasn't really performed. But they, they didn't get anybody that could finish things off for them. Like they got lads that can maybe make things happen, but nobody to finish them off. The midfield is pretty solid. It's a bunch of lads that can give you seven out of ten week after week after week. And that's all you're really asking for when you're Burnley. At the back, though, like you said, there's just... Like, Jordan Bayer looks a decent defender. Darrow O'Shea is a decent defender. Uh, they've gone out in in January here, and they've brought in uh, Maxime Esteve, who, by all accounts, uh, is is a very promising young defender. Hans Delacroix looks a promising young defender. But the problem is they're all promising young defenders. There's no lead centre-back there. There's no organiser there. There's no gnarly bastard that's going to scream and shout and get players in position. And I said going into January that the biggest thing they could do was find someone that could just organise them at the back. Just somebody that could talk younger players through the game. You probably have little to no chance of staying up anyway. So why not go and find somebody that could just get your back line looking solid and you could at least start putting in place a bit of a defensive structure so that when you go down next year that's in place that all of these young players have been guided along for six months by a more veteran presence who's been there and done and it doesn't have to be anybody great like Craig Dawson is a yard dog and always has been and he's been finished for years but he's gone to 
West Ham and now Wolves. And he's used his experience and his ability to talk to others to extend his career in the Premier League years after he's been actually good enough as a footballer to play in the league. Just that experience, that positional sense and that organisation. And I was looking around to see who could Burnley get. And the name that came to me was Connor Cody, who's not a great defender by any stretch, but he's a really good organiser. He's a really good talker. He's a good leader. And he's at Leicester this season. He's barely playing for them. And I guarantee he would have jumped at the chance to sign for a Premier League team in the hope of getting in the Euro squad for the summer. Because we know he's one of those that's kind of on the bubble. Or he, now he's he's probably out of the picture. But he was on the bubble, sort of, you know, on the fringe of things. We know Southgate likes him, but is he going to play regularly enough that Southgate will feel warranted in putting him in? I think he would have jumped at the chance to go to Burnley, even on loan for six months. And in the summer, you probably could have bought him cheap. And he, he would have gone down with you. He was happy to go down with Leicester. So he would have gone down when you helped you come back up and then you'd have been much better off. And you probably could have had him for, you know, for peanuts. But they went and they signed another young centre-back and another young right-back. And I get that you're planning for the long term, but losing becomes endemic. And that's all these players at Burnley are learning to do now is lose. They're not learning to win games. They're not learning what it is to prepare to win games. And I just don't see how the next six months is going to benefit the likes of, you know, James Trafford or any of these younger defenders when all they're going to be watching their team do is pick the ball out of the net. And they're going to be watching the midfield get frustrated with them. They're going to be watching or hearing the fans get frustrated with them because there's nobody there to guide them and lead them and organize them and help them and and r- remind them that when they can see the goal, it's not the end of the world to get the head up and get set again and get ready to do their job properly. There's nobody at that club, like look through the squad. There's nobody in that, at that club who's got that sort of presence in, in among the defenders. Charlie Taylor is the only one 26 and over and nobody's listened to Charlie Taylor. Nobody. Ever feel judged at the gym? You don't know how to use the leg curl machine? <laughs> Are you serious? This is this your first day alive? Um... <laughs> no, it's okay. I love helping people during their first day on Earth. At Planet Fitness, get energy without the judgment and join the judgment-free zone. Never intimidating. Always free fitness training and equipment for every workout. Get energized today during the Big Fitness Energy Sale for $1 down, $10 a month. Cancel any time. Deal ends Friday, February 16th. See Home Club for details. Yeah, I think it's an issue. I mean, like, there's obviously a a balance that they need to strike in terms of preparing the squad for the Premier League and preparing for the possibility of going back down. But I just think that, like you've said, like a lot of these players are really, 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 really young. Um, it's it's too young as a group to have experienced this kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the top, what, 10 players by minutes played in the Premier League this season. You've got one... Two players who are older than 24. Three, sorry. Josh Brownhill's 28. Charlie Taylor's 30. And Sander Berger is 25. So yeah. Sander Berger at 25, who is what? This is his second Premier League season? Yeah. Is their most senior player, uh, third most senior player. Like, it's not, it's not, a, it's, it's a good thing for building, team building, but you need a couple of years or you need some really, really good players dotted in and around them and obviously quite a lot of those are, are promising players or people who are still learning and could be good but they're not there yet so it's uh, it's not really a surprise to see where they are to be honest No and they've got like like they've got veteran heads in midfield they've got veteran heads in the attack like players that can at least pass on some guidance to others but like the oldest centre back at the club is Halmer Ekdal who's 25 He's a baby in centre back terms, but even even those more experienced players further forward, they're not regular starters. No, so they're not always on. No, the other pitch than Brownhill, yeah, at twenty five minutes in, when you go one or two nil down, they're not they're not there. They're not on the pitch 
putting an arm around or reorganizing or you know restarting. Jay Rodriguez has what started seven league games this season. Johan Goodmanson started a few, but he's played less than a thousand Premier League minutes. Even he's just Collins, injured anyway. Twenty-seven. So you know these these players are not on hand to do it. No, no, it's it just. I, 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 I could understand why they went the way they did in the summer, you know, going big on young talent. And I'm I'm all in favor of it. But we saw this movie 12 months earlier when Southampton leaned completely into a youth movement. Funnily enough, including a goalkeeper bought from Manchester City. And... It, last season was an absolute disaster for them and they got relegated. Now, this, they've got a chance to come back up this season, but it's not a guaranteed chance. They don't necessarily have a, 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 an automatic spot locked up because you've still got Ipswich, you've still got Leeds. They're in the mix for the second automatic promotion spot, but more likely they end up in the playoffs and the playoffs, anything can happen. Anything can happen in the playoffs. You you could just have a bad game and all of a sudden 46 good games are out the window. So Burnley need to be cautious that like, yeah, great. We go down. Most of these players are going to be fine to come down with us and it'll only be one season and we can add further, you know, for further talent or whatever. But I, I'd invite them to take a look at the Southampton team that's playing regularly because most of the young players aren't starting regularly. Like most of the young players, they went big on. Some obviously left, but most of them are squad players now. The goalkeeper's playing, Gavin Basunu. But aside from that, it's a lot more experienced players in the outfield towards this promotion charge. He tried the younger players earlier in the season, Russell Martin, and he's going nowhere. So he dropped some of them and went back to the more experienced heads. And that's what's got them in the promotion mix. And for Burnley, like, you might have to do the same, which means that you come back up in 18 months from now with a bunch of young players that have not really kicked a ball in 12 months. And what use is that to anybody? This is a very risky strategy. But I will say, they do play some nice football. And I do give them credit in that they came up with an identity and they have stuck to that identity. Now, you can say it's a fool's errand, but they do at least try and play the right way. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've seen it before. and We've discussed this. Issue, if you want to call it that, with various teams over the last few years, you know, Saints are one, Norwich are another. There's been others. Um, you know, is it is it the right thing to do to stick with your chosen way of playing, or is it the right thing to do to try and get points and stay in the league? Um, I think if it's, I think there would be more leeway if teams were doing that with, uh, let's say, like Luton, who have come up out of nowhere. It's their first season, and people expect them to go back down rather than a Burnley who were previously established and know what, as a club, not the players, but as a club, know what is required to be in the Premier League and to survive in the Premier League and so on. So I think the other thing that we have to obviously note is that while we've said the players are quite inexperienced, so too is the manager. Um, Mm. He's not far along his journey. He's obviously been top-ish end in Belgium, top end of the Championship. Yeah, but now this is the first time doing the other side of football management. So maybe there are lessons here that he's had to learn along the way as well. Maybe he underestimated the gap or the the requirements, basically, of, of making a squad top flight ready in England. Uh, it's perfectly possible. And maybe also he was told, doesn't matter if you finish last by 10 points, you're still going to keep your job and bring us back up next time. Yeah, he may well be on a promise. He may well be on a promise that no matter what, you're back next year. Um, and hopefully he does learn from from this this campaign. And hopefully if he does bring them back up, that he does so in a, with, with, with less naivety, you know, both on and off the field in terms of the approach to recruitment, etc., and then how they play. Are you that person who has everything? 
the coolest merch, and those must-have fan threads. Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. So at the moment, they're winless in their last five in the league. They've won, like I said, three games all season. So it's 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 really hard to get any sort of handle on them other than the fact that they just aren't very good. Uh, they've taken 13 points on the season. They've scored 24 goals, uh, but they've conceded 47, which is obviously quite problematic. Um, it is just odd to me that like a fella who was a defender doesn't seem to do much defensive coaching with his younger centre backs. Maybe because I'd imagine that's a part of why those players were keen to go and play for him is to learn from Vincent Company as a defender. Oh, I would imagine so. Um, you know, I don't know what their training setups like. Maybe he leaves all the training sessions to Craig Bellamy, so that's why they just attack, and that's why they have. 730 wide attackers and that's that's just what it is um you know they've lost sorry they've won two league games in four months mm. it's it's just not very good they've won one home premier league game all season long you know that, that's just whatever you are doing obviously needs an alteration at some point whether that's being a bit more pragmatic in your playing style or not. If you've only won once at home all season, something has to change. It doesn't have to be the style of play, but something obviously has to be altered there because it's not working. So, um, like I said, I, I don't really have too much surprise or sympathy in terms of what they're doing where they are, other than maybe the amount of points behind Luton they are. Um, but it, it didn't really at any point this term other than I will say at the start of the season when Wolves looked like they were going to be an absolute shambles um, prior to Gary Neal getting started, really. I don't think at any point too many people put them to stay up by too many points. No, if they were going to stay up, they were going to stay up in 17th by the skin of their teeth and it was going to take one of Everton, Forest, Wolves or Fulham when it looked like they might lose Paulinho and Marco Silva to go at Mitrovic. Like, that was kind of what Burnley were banking on, is somebody else to have a disastrous season. But as it turns out, Everton have been docked 10 points, and Burnley still aren't in a position to take advantage of it. Like you said, they're seven points behind Luton. And if you consider that last season in the championship, Burnley ran away with it. It wasn't even close. Burnley finished on 101 points, 10 points clear of Sheffield United. Now, Luton did finish third, but they finished on 80 points. So over 46 games last season, Luton finished 21 points behind Burnley. This season, through 23 Premier League games, and remember, Luton have a game in hand as well. They're now seven points better off. Like, Something has gone badly amiss there because Luton have had, Luton to their credit have done really well. They've done much better than anybody expected. But you still wouldn't look at it and go, wow, 20 points in 22 games. What an incredible achievement. It's just that Burnley have massively underperformed. Have they changed too much from last season, do you think? Because you've talked in the past about how you feel like there does need to be some continuity, which is, you know, in part what Luton have done, but they've added players as well. Not as many, but they have added players. But do you think, is it more because they still have that core that brought them up last year? Maybe. Uh, 
I mean, there's not loads of players in the squad there who had previously played Premier League. I do think keeping continuity is important for morale as much as obviously understanding through the players. Um, I mean, th- some of the key partnerships are not the same. Obviously, James Trafford coming in um, is, is going to make a change anyway. But um, I, I don't know. It's a, it, it is a difficult one, to be fair, because... There is a balance always when you come up out of the championship of needing to improve. Otherwise, you will just go back down again, barring ridiculous scenarios. But on the other hand, you don't want too much tempestuous change. Like, let's say, Nottingham Forest last season, possibly were a little bit lucky to stay up. Like, they had to be really good and really together in a couple of key runs to make sure that they did survive because there was so much change going on there. And obviously now that's led on to knock-on problems as well. So like you spoke about in in one of the pods a few weeks back, teams coming up have to change so much, but then they also have a really fine line to tread to not risk future penalties uh, when, when their spending is assessed coming up out mm. of the championship. And they they almost need to spend three times the amount because the squad is at least three times uh, below the required level, really. So kind of catch 2022. Uh, catch 22? Rather, not 2022. Um, but overall, I, I just think that there was too much inexperience in the squad, too much lacking, should we say, dirty players, hard players, gritful players. You know, someone with a bit of know how in each line would not go amiss. And even if you have got a couple of them who, you know, Johan Goodmanson's certainly been around the block, he, he knows how to win games he's been in in teams who grind out victories but he doesn't play oh, yeah. in a he doesn't play in a role which is central to everything where he's able to impart that on other people so there's just too much of that missing i think and relying on players who are you know between 19 and 23 yeah and it's it's just not going to work for you when you're trying to when when you've got so many of them trying to learn at once uh, so this weekend, they will have uh, no Nathan Redmond, uh, no Luke Koliashu. That's a really unfortunate one because he was really starting to play well and then he got a season-end injury. Uh, Jordan Byers expected to miss out this weekend, as is Charlie Taylor. Uh, Hans Delacroix has a knock but might be okay. For the Reds, no Joel Matip, uh, no Zabozlai. We don't really know what the situation is with Zabozlai. There was reports from Hungarian outlets that he was going to miss seven to eight games. Uh, Then Ben Boxack said that he'd been told it was looking more like maybe three weeks, which still would have been five to six games. Um, But now it seems like it might be shorter than that, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, No Stefan Besetic. Mo Salah probably not back in time for this one, but we're... I think hopefully he'll be back from Brentford. Costas, maybe another week away, but getting close. Waturo Endo is back, so that's big. And we'll just wait and see what happens with Connor Bradley, obviously dealing with the tragic passing of his father. Uh, he'll be given as much time as he needs. There's, you know, He's a young lad who's just lost his dad. Don't rush him back. Let him come back as and when he, he feels ready. And obviously Ibu got himself sent off in order to get himself a break so he could have a little bit of a rest. Um, So he'll be out for this one as well. So, Ali, obviously, who's starting right back in this game for you, Carl? Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa. He does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. 
So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. The reason I ask is because we're light in midfield with Dominic out. And I've seen some suggestion that people would like to see Trent, Alexis, Curtis in midfield as a three, which would mean Joe Gomez right back and Andy Robertson left back. Would that enter the the consideration for you at all? Yeah, that would be absolutely fine. Um, In fact, it might actually make the most sense, to be perfectly honest. I don't think that Graben Birch or Gakpo should be in the team. No. I don't think that it's there's anyone else really who can cover one of the fullback spots and if and there's nobody else to come into midfield who is senior. So um if the one who comes in now for a start and it's you know possibly time for him to get a start and get a sixty, seventy minutes is Robertson, then I don't think Gomez deserves to be left out. So yeah, if we move him across and then Trent does push into midfield, then they are all senior players. They are all first team options. And ahead of those Dutch duo, I think they're the ones who probably deserve to be playing at the minute. Yeah. Um. Look, I, I don't want to lump the two Dutch boys in together because one of them, I think he's a victim of poor management this season. I think Cody Gakpo has been really poorly handled by Jurgen this year. Like, has he had two games in a row in the same position? How is he ever meant to establish rhythm, form, you know, an understanding, partnership, when he's here, there, and everywhere? He's played I, right wing, he's played through the middle, he's played left wing, he's played right agree. side at eight and left side at eight. I do agree with this uh, in terms of, um, you know, off, off the ball work. Uh, sorry, sorry on the ball work in terms of combination play and in terms of his own uh, technical touch and all the rest of it and confidence in front of goal and so on and so forth. But there's absolutely nothing stopping him doing more than he does right now. Nothing. I, I, I will not have that rotating positions means that he's so weak in a challenge or that he doesn't offer enough off the ball in terms of his movement or that he still shows no anticipation when we're getting down the channels to make the runs, which every other forward does, and he doesn't. No, he is he is big and he's soft. There's no question. Like he is a soft player. He's six four and he plays like he's five foot two. And I said when we signed him, the comparison I made was Shinji Kagawa. That's who he reminds me of. And I think if you want to get the best of him, that's the role he would need to play for us. Is as a ten in a four two three one as the connector, as the one that links play. Doesn't make the killer pass, but makes the killer run off the ball. Now, you're right. His movement, his runs of late have been really poor. But earlier in the season, he was doing them really well. The problem for Cody Gakbo is we don't play 4 2 3 one. Because I do think Gakbo behind Darwin is something we should have looked heavily at at some point this season. Just to see. Instead... Jürgen decided not to. Fair enough. His decision, absolutely fine. Results have gone in his favour. No need to question it. I just feel like Cody has been... He's sort of been the victim of how well the team has done in that Jürgen doesn't really like to break up winning combinations, winning duos, winning teams. So he was dropping Gakpo in here, there and everywhere rather than saying, look, here's two or three games in this position. It was like, right, Darwin needs a rest. You play a game there. Okay, thanks for that. Now Darwin's back in. Oh, now we need you here because Dominic needs a rest. So you play right now you're out. Dominic's back in. You know, he wasn't given a run of games and it's probably affected his confidence as well. The other fella, on the other hand, is just lazy. Like he is just lazy. And... This is not just me that says this. Julian Nagelsmann said this. Thomas Tuchel said this. Every journalist that covered him while he was at Bayern said this. 
Ajax fans said it in his last season there too. Journalists who covered Ajax in that last season said it too. He is just a lazy footballer. And there's an an obvious comparison to make with Paul Pogba in terms of the size, the technical ability. Now, he's not as talented as Pogba, but he is a very talented young footballer. But the difference between him and Pogba is, when Pogba was 21, he was busting his ass. When Paul Pogba was 21, he was killing himself week in, week out to get in that Juventus team, going up against Arturo Vidal, Marquisio, and Pirlo for a starting spot. And he was busting himself every single week to make sure he got his minutes. When he got on the pitch, he put in all the effort required, and he eventually won himself a starting spot. Now, he went to United and became bone idle. This fella failed at Bayern. Can't be looked at any other way. He was a failure at Bayern. This is his opportunity to prove that Bayern were wrong about him, to prove that Tuchel and Nagelsmann were wrong to give up on him. And he's done absolutely nothing to suggest that they were wrong. Like, his effort level, Carl, is a disgrace. His body language is shocking. Standing around, throwing his arms up in the air. Have you seen the footage of Klopp after the first Arsenal goal? He absolutely flitted him because of the lazy nature of his press. He jogged, he stopped, he jogged a bit more, and then he gave up. And he let Arsenal just run away down that side. Like, that's not good enough. All we are, look, yeah, he's 21. That's what people keep saying to me. He's only 21. Fair enough. He's got more experience than most 23 year olds. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Um, we didn't pay 5, 8, 12 million for them. We paid 35 million for them. We paid the type of money that you pay for players to make an impact now, not in two or three years. If we paid 10 million for him, you'd be like, all right, fair enough, whatever. We paid a lot of money for this kid. And he has a lot of experience. But the bare minimum we're asking for here is you put in the effort. And he just doesn't. No, I mean, we saw some promising early season performances um, and a lot of that was obviously attacking play um, in the Europa League uh, in games which were a bit lower tempo, more space on the pitch. Liverpool obviously have a far greater quality. We definitely haven't seen enough from him in more than flashes in the matches which really matter in Premier League games, in matches where we're up against it at times. Um, There's also Definitely a valid question over productivity um, in a season now where we are getting more from midfield uh, and in players who are 
large parts of their games are based around getting in the box, having shots, creating chances and so on. Is he doing enough there even when he does get the start? Um, I think we also both agree that he early season looked a lot more uh, a better fit for the team when he was that right side adoption rather than the left one, um, which doesn't quite seem to suit his off-ball game. And while I don't doubt that the coaching staff would over time get him to bring that defensive work rate into his game, otherwise he wouldn't play, um, they're not going to be there now. <laughs> so he kind of has a decision to make and I don't think it's like a case of what well, we have to sell him if he's not going to do it straight away. But, you know, depending on the type of manager who comes in, he may find himself very quickly out of favour. He may find himself very quickly out on loan because the next guy will have no tie to him. The next guy won't have to justify the fee. Do you know? Like if it's, if it's Xabi Alonso and he comes in, and he sees this fella wandering around the place, putting in zero, zero effort on and off the ball. He's just going to go. All right, don't even want to. Don't even want to get into that. Get him out on loan somewhere. Let him go and play somewhere. I didn't buy him, so I don't have to justify it. Jurgen has to justify it because Jurgen is the one that went and pushed through that deal because Pep and Linders told him to. Like. I don't see, if you look at the managers being linked to Liverpool, Alonso, Amaram, De Zerbi, all play a double pivot in midfield. What did Thomas Tuchel say in the press conference after they sold him? The reason we're selling him is because he can't play in a double pivot. Like there was many other reasons, but that was the public reason, is that he cannot play in a midfield too. What he didn't want to say is because he because he's fucking bone idle. He doesn't do any work, any work. But like, so he, where's he going to play? Like, it's fine. Jurgen can try and shoehorn him into our team with two really hard grafting players, both of whom are, are better players than him, but have been asked to carry water for him. But the next guy is not going to want to do that. He's not going to want to carry a liability off the ball. And he's not going to have to either. So Gravenberg is going to have to shape up. He's going to have to get his act together. Like there's there's loads of talent in the kit. But unless he starts putting in the effort. Oh, and I don't care if he was to play shit for 10 games in a row. And actually run himself into the ground. You wouldn't mind at all. But the fact is, he plays shit and doesn't run himself into the ground. Just ambles about. And that's the concern. Like, the crowd, the Liverpool fan base will forgive a lot of things if a player works hard. Like, look at some of the the real kind of heroes over the years. Players like Dirk Kout didn't have a fraction of the technical ability that Gravenberg had. Came to Liverpool as a nine flopped and became a hard grafting right winger but he's adored because of his work rate because of how hard he put in for the team that's all you have to do that literally is all you have to do there are still people trying to claim Lucas Leiva was great he wasn't he was terrible but he worked hard he worked hard Lalana was awful he ran himself into the ground every time he was asked to play Milner Henderson all of these players, they weren't good enough to play for Liverpool. Technically, they didn't have the ability to play for Liverpool. But they had the work rate and the aptitude and the attitude to play. And they carved out much better careers for themselves than their talent should have otherwise allowed them to. And this lad, unfortunately, is trending in exactly the opposite direction. Where he gets to be like 25 and you, you see a thing on Sky Ryan Gravenberg has joined, I don't know, Krosnodar it's... on loan from, from fucking Lecce or somewhere. And you're like, all right, that's that's a bit mad that he's gone to play in Russia at 25. But sure, what about it? Like, you know, that's that's the unfortunate thing. That's that's the worst case scenario. But for him, like, if he doesn't work out at Liverpool, 
It's very hard to see any other top club taking a chance on them. Yeah, there haven't really been too many who we buy don't do well and get another chance elsewhere, to be honest, over the last few years. Obviously, most of our buys are, thankfully, either involved or reasonable successes or far beyond that. So there's not like a big bank to look back on and say, well, I can still do what this fella did. Um, it's it's a, it's a first year, so I think that there's an element of not forgiving stuff, but things that can be assessed in summer and said, look, this is what you've got to do in season two. But with that now being, like I said, with a, a new manager, a new coaching structure entirely, quite possibly some new teammates, a new formation, and even new uh, decision makers, let's say, above the head mm. coach. Yeah, might only be a year. Because, like, the thing is, there's, there's a there's a good chance that Liverpool already have a fairly strong idea of who the next manager is going to be and that that manager has already been approached and had talks and maybe has a loose agreement to take over. And if that is the case, then they're going to be watching Liverpool for the rest of the season. And every player, like, it's audition time. It's audition time for every Liverpool player. Because just because you've been great under Jurgen, now there's some exceptions. Mo, Verge, Ali, like it doesn't matter who comes in. They're all going to be in the team. As long as they want to be here, they'll be in the team. Trent, you probably throw into that basket as well. But for all the rest, you're auditioning for your future. You don't have credit in the bank. So you need to be performing. And if, let's say it's Alonso, or Amarim, and they watch Liverpool three games in a row and they see Curtis Jones and Alexis McAllister and Dominic Sabozlai and Maturo Endo coming off the pitch looking shattered, having run themselves into the ground. And then Gravenberg wanders on and off, having not broken sweat. Who do you think they're going to be impressed by? How much impact would you say he needs to have between now and the end of the season to be considered, let's say, among the first choice midfielders or to give the club reason to not think they need to go and spend fairly big in that area of the park? Do you think um, it's even doable between now and the end of the season? No, because I don't... Well, see, I don't think he should play barring catastrophic injury crisis. Like, look at our midfielders. So he's not going to play in the six, obviously. So he's going to play as an eight. That's two positions. So would you play... Let's let's play a little game here. Would you play Curtis Jones or Ryan Gravenberg? You know I'd play Jones. Dominic Zabozlai or Ryan Gravenberg? As long as the hamstrings are fit, we'll take the number eight. Alexis McAllister or Ryan Gravenberg? Mm-hmm. Tiago Alcantara or Ryan Gravenberg? How many minutes of Tiago do I get? You get as many as he's capable of. So 17, okay. I'll take Tiago, yeah. Right, so there's four. We've only got 15 league games left. We've got one game in one cup, potentially, what, four in another. There's 20 and potentially seven games left in the Europa League. Is that right? Semis and final, yep, seven. Right. So we've got 27 games left potentially this season. So there's four players ahead of him in those two positions. Would you play Harvey Elliott or Ryan Gravenberg? In a must-win game where you need players, you're all going to be up against it and you need players that are going to give you work. Who are you picking? Yeah, Elliott. Yeah. You might even pick Bobby Clark over him at this point, Carl, because at least you know he'll work. Like This is the problem for Gravenberg. The talent is there, but you can't trust him because you don't know if he's going to put in the effort because most weeks he doesn't. Some weeks it seems to click with him. Like a couple of weeks ago, he had a really good game. Really good game. It was the first time he played well from the start for Liverpool since about September. Like you said, he had, the, he had a really good start playing lower caliber teams in the Europa League and he played against Leicester in the EFL Cup. 
But against any Premier League team, he's only really played well maybe three times in total. And one of them was a cup game. Like, he's just, he's not reliable. And we've got too many good players in those positions to waste minutes on him. So, like, I'm sure he'll play against Southampton in the FA Cup. Depending on the draw, he might well play in the EFL Cup round of 16. But I, I don't imagine, I don't, I don't see him starting many league games moving forward. Barring, again, barring catastrophic injuries. And I don't see him starting the League Cup final. So, like, I just don't think there's going to be enough games for him. And it's his own fault. It is his own fault. Because all it takes is graft. Yeah, he needs needs performances off the bench. He needs to have an impact. And we've seen probably four or five players do that for us this season already. A couple of players in midfield and, and the forward line in particular, but even people like Costas coming in when his opportunity arose and he was playing quite well before his own injury, that kind of thing. These are the ones he needs to take the the guidance from. And uh, when his appearances come off the bench or maybe a Europa League start, something like that, back to the start of the season, those are where you've got to perform and then you might get in the league team. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. He, he, he's got to take his chances when he gets them. And if he doesn't, then he can't blame anybody when he doesn't start. You know, but this this is the same thing that happened at Bayern last year, where he got opportunities and didn't take them. And then when he didn't get more opportunities, he went and he complained to the media. And then Julian Nagelsmann decided, well, fuck this, I'm just going to leak stuff out through my friends in the media. So he leaked out that there was a, a friendly during the winter break the plan was for Gravenberg to play the whole 90 and he hauled him off at half time because he was so poor defensively and wouldn't put in the work. And Nagelsmann just le- leaked it out because he got fed up with Gravenberg constantly going whinging about not getting playing time. So, you know, it'd be nice to see him just cop himself on a little bit for the run in because if, if he could become a contributing, a real contributing factor. It would help us for certain because he's very, very talented. Um, Right, so back to the Liverpool team for this game against Burnley. Ali and goal. You said that you don't think Joe Gomez should be dropped. I agree. But would you go Gomez right back, Robbo left back, Trent in midfield? Or do you go Trent right back, Gomez left back, and a midfield of Alexis, Endo, and Jones? Well, you could do that and still play Gomez, to be fair, because with Canate or suspended, you could put Gomez back at centre-back. At centre-back, yeah, true. Yeah. But I actually want Kwanzaa to start this game because um, I think that there may not be loads more opportunities uh, in the in the coming weeks ahead. and. At some point or another, just like now, we may need to call upon him. So it's better that he does maintain some involvement, some, you know, the odd rotation match. He's been in and out for Canate, even in league, like every third or fourth game, more or less. So I feel like we just take this as that game, to be honest, and play him centre back. So I'm going to go Gomez at right back, Robertson left, Virgil and Kwanza, and then Trent, Jones, and Alexis as the midfield three, and we'll bring Endo on. Endo on off the bench. Boots on, gun shield in, and away to war we go. Uh, up front then, uh, I assume you're just bringing Darwin back in and going Jota, Darwin, Diaz. Yes. Yeah. I would do the same. And what's your prediction for this game? Um... It probably shouldn't be tempered by the result against Arsenal or the performance against Arsenal because we've obviously been, you know, we've lost a game before and come back and had a good performance and we were playing really well before that. So I will just go normal, I think, and say 3 0. You know, we're at home to the side in the relegation zone. It's not the highest profile of game. Sometimes that can make it a little bit meh to start things, but hopefully we'll have. Uh, 
will have had a week being very, very focused on getting the job back on track and mm. just go out and do what we need to do. Like Burnley are not tremendous at stopping chances being created against them. We're usually pretty good at doing it. So 3 0, I think, is fair. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fair shout. I'm going to be more pessimistic and I'm going to go 2 0. I'm going to go 2 0. Nice, dull 2 0 where nothing happens and we just get ourselves through to Brentford. And then we win that nice and dull and we get ourselves through to the next game. And then they're just all really boring wins the rest of the way. That's what I want. I want boredom. I want people to suffer for these trophies. <laughs> right. Uh, have you had anything to plug before we go? Uh, if people are listening Wednesday, then there's pre semi finals AFCON stuff. Uh, one piece on both games. If you're listening after Wednesday, I will no doubt have a piece in the lead up to the final of the AFCON. I may have a, a Liverpool piece ahead of the weekend and possibly something on uh, a Welsh team. I'll leave it at that for now. Oh, there you go. He's actually working, ladies and gentlemen. It's a miracle. He always bloody uh, works, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> right, folks, take care of yourselves. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.